It's 1981. Just one year into the 80s, we would be introduced to a slew of things that would make this decade so iconic. A time when it was more than appropriate to roll down your car window at a stoplight and ask for some mustard. Pardon me, would you have any gray poupon? But of course. When fast food would forever be changed with the phenomenon known as the McRib that would be unleashed unto the masses. The most 80s car ever was introduced with winged doors and a stainless steel frame with the DeLorean. A little plumber known as Jumpman would rule the arcades against a gorilla in Donkey Kong. And music videos would rule cable networks with MTV. But catchphrases and video games aren't the only things that we first got a look at. In the realm of horror, we would not only see the number of titles more than double, it would also be a year that a certain subgenre would overpopulate. This is 1981, the year of the slashers in our 80s horror memories. You know, I, I think my favorite thing about being a horror director and, and having the privilege of being in this community is that there are so many subgenres of horror. And, you know, I think um, in the 80s was that, I, I guess, time that's really paramount time in my life where I was able to figure out my likes and desires as it related to horror. What would 80s horror even be without a good old fashioned slasher? It's the comfort food equivalent to a more sophisticated film. We all know how these movies play out, but we flock to the multiplexes anyway. After the success of Friday the 13th, production companies put a rush out on these films, on the cheap to capitalize on genre. Compared to the year before, 1981 had at least 30 slashers released that year. Most of them are pretty forgettable today, to say the least. For every now debatable classic like The Prowler, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, or Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, we would get things like Graduation Day or Final Exam. And you know what? Even the duds have something fun about them. While in this particular year we didn't get introduced to a killer to stand the true test of time for the masses, we did get a few notables worth mentioning which didn't get the justice that they deserved at the time. So let's sit by the campfire, kids, as I tell you four tales that will keep you up at night. In the town of Valentine Plus, there are many ways to die. Take your pick. My bloody Valentine. Ah, yes, Valentine's Day. The day we shell out countless amounts of money to prove to our loved ones how much they mean to us. A date synonymous with red roses, greeting cards, and a box of toothpaste filled chocolates. However, in the town of Valentine Bluffs, you may just receive a box with a bloodied heart. And they say true love never dies. My Bloody Valentine, George Mahalko's My Bloody Valentine, which is a, a, a wonderful piece of, of Canadian slasher history. Released that February, My Bloody Valentine tells the story of the townsfolk of Valentine Bluffs, a small mining community which has a dark history involving several fatalities in an accidental explosion in the coal mine. The accident's sole survivor, Harry Warden, began taking revenge on those he deemed responsible. Now years later, and the memory of Harry just a distant memory, a group of young miners and their girlfriends begin to organize the very first Valentine's Day dance since the accident. But once the body count resumes, it appears as though Harry Warden is out to finish what he started. It's no secret that most slashers are identical in plot and setup, especially in the early formations of the genre. But what separates this film from the plethora of slashers from 1981 and arguably the remainder of the decade, is its treatment of the characters. For the most part, we go to these movies for the kills, but everyone here is just so damn likable, you're rooting for all of them to make it. But when they go out, they really go out. It stands out for that, I think, for a lot of reasons. And it also, there's, a, there's an element of, of 
of humor to it. You know, there's some general, some genuine goofiness to that movie. Um, it is the only deaths where some a movie I think where somebody is murdered with wiener water <laughs> um, as they're drowned in a, in a big tub of boiling hot dogs. Um, but you know, the wiener water would murder. That's that's. Uh, uh, I think you could do a, you know a sequel to that one called the, you know Wiener Water Murders, but it'd be great. However, at the time, audiences weren't allowed to see just how far the movie went. Before release, the film had to remove so much gore to receive its R rating that nine minutes had to be excised. Part of that is, is its release being so close to the assassination of, of John Lennon. So there was a real backlash against these slasher violent films uh, in the wake of that killing. One could say its underwhelming box office take could be due to how tame the kills ended up being compared to another Paramount release the year prior. Despite it being a commercial failure, it has aged wonderfully and received a restoration from Scream Factory, complete with the edited scenes in all of their glory. While plenty of slashers churned out a series of sequels, it's both a shame and a blessing that this film never got that chance. Believe me, I could watch countless films about a miner seeking out revenge. I mean, his image alone is far better than a fisherman and a black rain slicker. But sometimes, for the best ones, a one and done is really all you need. My Bloody Valentine ended up finding a new audience in 2009 when a 3D remake was released. During that period of time, it seemed like everyone was trying to cash in on both the remake and the 3D trend, with most of them being pretty unmemorable. But former Wes Craven editor Patrick Lussier understood the assignment by bringing the fun campiness of the 80s, which had been missing in these remakes. It fared both critically and commercially better than the original, and was one of the best times that I've had in a theater. But if it weren't for that film, I may not have found one of the best slasher films of the 1980s. Coming soon from Universal Pictures. Oh, the fun now. So that was, interestingly, one that I had on video. I didn't see the theaters, but I saw it on video. When you first hear the name Toby Hooper, more than likely you will automatically associate his name with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Poltergeist. And I can't really blame you. Those two films were staples for me growing up and are widely considered important pieces of cinema. How his career never exploded like the other greats in horror is beyond me. Like most of us who grew up in the age of video stores and before the era of streaming, I would often see the box art of his titles without knowing his association with them. One in particular, which was sandwiched between his two most popular films, had a cover so misleading that it could easily be construed as a bad direct-to-video romp. Despite what the poster promises you, this movie has nothing to do with creepy clowns. Released at the tail end of winter, Toby Hooper's The Fun House follows four 33-year-old looking teenagers who go to a trashy traveling carnival. After deciding that it would be fun to spend the night at the carnival's funhouse ride, they witness a murder by a man wearing the mask of Frankenstein's monster. Now locked inside, the friends must escape from the deformed killer and the carnival's psychotic workers. Sounds awesome, right? The movie was Hooper's first major studio picture after his very successful TV movie, Salem's Lot. Universal Studios wanted to dip their toes into the teen slasher sandbox after Paramount's success with Friday the 13th. Unfortunately, despite having critical praise, the funhouse just didn't connect well with audiences. Yes, compared to other slasher films unleashing upon moviegoers, this one is a little slower. But it is very unique and not at all a carbon copy of the heavy hitters. And having it set at a carnival just makes it all the better. Carnival horror just isn't touched on enough as it should be. From gems like Ghoulies 2 to more recent fare like the underrated Hellfest, I can't think of a single one which doesn't at least offer a fun time at the movies. And the Funhouse is no exception. 
Top that off with special effects maestro Rick Baker, and a ticket to this show is more than worth the price of admission. When I was a kid, my father, who liked technology, so we had like Betamax, and we actually wound up getting a, a VCR very early on, uh, I worked very hard to get a second VCR. So I would rent movies, and I would copy those movies, so I had a huge library of horror movies, and one of them was The Fun House, which I watched over and over and over again. Not just for the titillating bits, but for the reveal of that creature, and the design of the creature, and the look of the creature. It just, to me, ca encapsulated everything that I loved at that time of what horror movies could do in terms of how it made me feel. It was both scary, it was intriguing, it was visually interesting, it was funny, and, uh, and ultimately it transported me to a world that I was not familiar with. on for terror is not over friday the 13th part two if there is one thing that you can expect yearly in the slashers of the 80s it's a sequel the film to do it first comes from the one that really jump-started the craze friday the 13th part two okay this one is a little bit of a cheat but how can we talk about slasher films without bringing up one of the biggest stars of them all? As we have mentioned in the 1980 episode, Jason will forever be cemented as the face of the franchise. But picture yourself in a crowded theater of some horror movie, and suddenly the trailer for this comes on. Imagine how shocked you would be. You have to remember, this was during the days before Al Gore invented the internet. There would be no way of knowing a movie where the killer dies at the end would continue. Unless you were an avid reader of Fangoria or something. You would probably think to yourself, how in the hell could she come back after getting her head chopped off? Well, friends, that question was answered by unleashing one of the biggest villains of all time. Jason Voorhees. Released less than a year after the original, Part 2 picks up two months after final girl Alice decapitated Mrs. Voorhees. While alone in her apartment, Alice finds that very head inside her refrigerator, and ends up getting killed by an ice pick. As it turns out, little Jason never really drowned, and has been living as a hermit in the woods. After seeing his mother killed, his heart fills with a taste for revenge. Five years later, a group of new counselors set up shop at a new training center, neighboring the condemned Camp Crystal Lake. But after the new counselors once again ignore the warnings of Crazy Ralph, the body count resumes. The first Friday the 13th stands as a classic for a reason, yet the first sequel does what every great horror sequel should do, by making them bigger and better with a larger budget and more scares. Gone is the mystery element of who the killer is, which never truly worked in the first place. And instead, we see our killer with a sack over his head. We don't get to the iconic hockey mask until the third one, but his appearance in this is still equally frightening. It's very reminiscent of the killer from The Town That Dreaded Sundown. The only difference is Jason's mask has only one eye hole. In my VHS days as a teen, I proudly showcased this series on my shelf, but I always found myself skipping the first one and going straight into part two. Not only does it pretty much show you everything you need to know what happened in the original, but the pacing is so much better, and the quirks of the characters feel even more endearing. We also get an equally great final girl with Amy Steele's Ginny, who ends up having a better fate than Alice. Sean S. Cunningham sat this one out as line producer Steve Miner took on the directing duties. He would go on to have a hell of a career directing films like House and Halloween H2O. Also notably missing is the makeup effects from Tom Savini. However, the effects are still as good, using Savini's work as a blueprint. Instead, Savini went on to work with makeup on a different slasher film. Five years 
years ago is about to happen again and again and again. The Burning. Volcano and Dante's Peak. Armageddon and Deep Impact. Christine and Halloween Ends. Okay, so maybe that's not the best example. But you see where I'm going with this. Pretty much since the beginning of cinema, films with similar plots have been released at the same time from different studios, resulting in the moniker of Twin Films. Whether it's coincidental or just a race to see which production gets out the fastest, the one to hit the screens last is usually regarded as a ripoff. But one in particular in the slasher genre stands out above the rest. The summer camp slasher, The Burning. I mean, The Burning is sort of like a, it's not, it's a classic, but it's not in the running with the ones and the titles that we still talk about today. Released just one week after Friday the 13th Part 2, The Burning follows a summer camp caretaker who is victim to a prank gone wrong, which leaves him horrifically burned. Five years later, he returns to the camp, armed with a pair of garden shears, to seek vengeance on a new set of counselors. It's perfectly easy to look at this film and dismiss it as a straight-up copycat of Friday the 13th. And for the longest time, I too felt the same way. When visiting video stores throughout my youth, I would snicker to myself at all the VHS covers of movies that were clearly cashing in on the summer camp mayhem of Crystal Lake. And boy, did some of these look hilariously bad. And this was, you know, before the days of IMDb. You couldn't just, you, you couldn't look up what this was. So it was based solely on the box art. And um, so for me, I think that my uh, love of these kind of 80s horror films stemmed from VHS cassette tapes and box art. Um, if, you know, I probably missed some amazing gems because they didn't have great box art. Even at the time of release, some critics even called it out as an obvious clone to Friday the 13th, which is a possible reason for its low box office take. But those that saw it would be treated with a damn fine script and amazing practical effects from Mr. Savini. He brought his expertise used on the first Friday the 13th film and implemented it even further here and amped up the gore to 11, most notably during a massacre involving some of the counselors on a raft. Absolutely brutal. It should be noted too that while there are some similarities, the script was actually written back in the late 70s, before Mrs. Voorhees had even unleashed her wrath. The film's villain, Cropsy, was based on a New York urban legend about an escaped mental patient who, after the death of his son, kidnaps several children. That in and of itself would make an interesting movie, but the screenwriters took this campfire story and spun it into a fun little thrill ride that just does not let up. If only this came out at a different time, maybe we would have had as many films featuring Cropsy as we did Jason. Recently, there have been many throwbacks to a time when these films were actually fun, with some even capturing the magic of 80s cinema, like The Final Girls, or even playing around with the slasher icon tropes in the criminally underrated Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. And for better or worse, Michael Myers has even returned to dominate the box office. So regardless of which side of the fence you sit on, it's a good time to be a horror fan. What are some of your favorite slashers from this time? No matter what generation you're from, boomers to Gen Z, we would love to hear your thoughts on what brought you to horror. Leave us a comment down below, we'd love to talk to you. Until then, my fellow gorehounds, stay tubular. Gal with a shape that drives me. My, as I mentioned, my my father and I would go to Blockbuster every Friday night, and I got to get it was three movies that we always got, uh, one for him and my mother, one for the entire family, and then one for my dad and I. And um, I must have been, I guess, ten, ten or eleven, and uh, girls were a thing for me at that point. 
and I'm going to be very um, forthcoming, and I've told Cassandra this herself, so uh, I can say it here. Um, I, one of the first like major obsessions I had was Elvira. As an adolescent growing up in the 80s, we didn't have many options on what we could watch on our old 4x3 television sets. With just four channels and a remote control that was actually attached to the TV. That's right, young folks of the future watching this, we had it hard. In fact, we only had one TV in the house to share amongst the whole family for a while. So often my brother and I would have to watch what our parents were watching. This set its drawbacks and its benefits. We'd often be subjected to awful soap operas, cool wrestling shows, and sometimes, mainly late at night, our dad would, well, accidentally stumble across Cassandra Peterson's alter ego on Elvira's Heavy Metal Heaven. The show saw Elvira hosting six programs celebrating the timeless rock phenomenon of deathless appeal, heavy metal. As a young and impressionable youth who had already had a penchant for metal, thanks to the likes of Guns N' Roses, Iron Maiden, Skid Row, and Metallica, plus with hormones raging, I was instantly smitten with the Mistress of the Dark. How's your head? I haven't had any complaints yet. My enthrallment with Elvira made me eagerly look out for each installment of Heavy Metal Heaven. And unlike the plethora of opportunities to consume content nowadays, this meant waiting until late on a weekend night. Or perhaps stealing one of my Big Brother's VHS tapes to record it on and watch later. Despite being best known as Elvira, if you actually delve back into Peterson's early life and career, you'll find tragedy and success in equal measure. When she was only one year old, she climbed onto the kitchen stove and accidentally knocked a kettle of boiling water over herself, badly burning her shoulders, neck, back, and legs. She lost hair, her eyelids were fused shut, and her skin was badly burned. Looking back at the incident, she said, Everywhere that my mother had to hold on to me, the skin came off. They didn't think I was going to survive, because 35% of my body was third degree burns. In order to treat the injuries young Cassandra suffered, she received experimental penicillin treatment at a burn center that saved her life plus multiple surgeries and skin grafts for her scarring. Such a horrific accident would be difficult enough for most people to contend with. However, according to Peterson, she owes her interest in everything spooky to this childhood accident, and it helped to shape the person and the character that she is and portrays still to this day. She said, quote, I was severely burned and I felt like a monster myself. I think I related to people like Frankenstein and the Mummy. The burns made me feel like an outcast and a loner. I was certainly not popular. I was a major geek. As a lot of people can probably attest to in this wonderful industry in which we preside, and also the alternative environment we find ourselves embracing, being a geek is something that should be shouted from the gothic rooftops. Peterson's awful childhood accident may have spurred her on towards her love of horror, and if it wasn't for the then experimental penicillin treatment that she received, she may have very well lost her life at a tragically young age. Cassandra Peterson first found fame as Elvira on the aforementioned Elvira's Movie Macabre on Los Angeles TV network KHJ-TV, with the show airing domestically from 1981 to 1986. She was also a member of the improvisational LA comedy troupe known as The Groundlings, and in part based her Elvira persona on a valley girl type character that she created while still a member of the troupe. However, it wasn't until the huge popularity of the 1988 movie Elvira, Mistress of the Dark before Peterson, or more accurately, her vivacious alter ego, became a household name. The success of Peterson's earlier show helped to establish her quirky personality and love of all things spooky, and thanks to this, the world now had a new icon in the making. 
Despite success being firmly on the horizon for Peterson with Elvira's movies and TV shows gaining popularity, her journey to the highs and lows of the character continued to be something she would reflect upon years later. The Elvira we know and love today started out as a singular vision, modeled after Sharon Tate's redhead character in Fearless Vampire Killers, and looking back at the awesome visage of this 1967 movie's beautiful protagonist, you can see why. However, when the LA TV station that hired Peterson rejected that idea, she worked with her artistic collaborator, Robert Redding, on a more punk rock 80s take on the classic vampire. Leather bracelets, black nail polish, a jaggedly torn dress hem, paired with a fabulous hairdo by Redding's favorite singer, Ronnie Spector. This look became the signature style for the character, and although her sexuality and suggestive costumes would cause consternation from some, her look helped in some ways to empower her, and also hide the literal scars of the past, Elvira's gorgeous black hair being just long enough to cover the scars from that tragic accident when she was a baby. The horror genre is currently alive, thriving, and kicking ass in cinemas and streaming services and continues to lean on classic franchises and new voices in the industry to scare and delight gorehounds. However, back in the 1980s and 90s, the horror genre was still seen as something lowbrow and left to late-night horror hosts to bring it to the mainstream. While Elvira is arguably the most well-known and recognizable of these hosts, I would be remiss to not take a look at the influence of legendary writer, actor, and comic performer Joe Bob Briggs. Born in Texas in 1953, John Irving Bloom started his career relatively early, at the age of just 13, as a sports writer at the Arkansas Democrat. This led to awards and other successful ventures into journalism that eventually led to a writing role at Texas Monthly Magazine, where he created the humorous persona Joe Bob Briggs to review exploitation films and other genre movies. Bloom's acting persona takes the form of an unapologetic redneck Texan with a penchant for drive-in theaters, B-movies, and cult films which he calls drive-in movies. He uses his wonderful personality to parody the more urbane, highbrow movie criticism, and his columns tend to include colorful takes of woman troubles and the odd brush with the law. And if you've seen any of his reviews, you'll no doubt be aware of the quirks he used at the end of each segment to conclude the film's high points, or to be more precise, the quality of the action, the body count, the amount of female breasts on display, how much blood is spilled, and in the most extreme cases, a vomit meter. Anyway, I digress. The ongoing debate surrounding the effect of mainstream entertainment on moral standards in the populace is fascinating, and Joe Bob Briggs' early style of movie reviews would arguably not sit well with modern sensibilities, rightly or wrongly. Excerpts from his reviews, such as the following example, are a good indication of this. Quote, no dead bodies, 117 breasts, multiple aardvarking, lap dancing, cage dancing, convenience store dancing, blindfold aardvarking, blind man aardvarking, lesbo foo, pool cue foo, drive-in Academy Award nominations for Tane McClure. Joe Bob says, check it out. Briggs' reviews were initially limited to drive-in movies only, but he would later go on to critique films on VHS and DVD. Ah, VHS, we miss your grainy, impossible to decipher pause screens, dubious picture quality, and especially the, ahem, unique copies of movies my brother's friends, uncle's dads, and others would procure for us from the high seas, apparently. There was nothing more rewarding of kudos on the playground than telling your buddies you had an early copy of Terminator 2 on VHS. Coming on video cassette. I'll bite with some dude getting out of his seat randomly to buy another hot dog in the middle of the movie. Still, kudos was achieved, if not a moral conscience. I can't believe it. I can't believe we rented this tape and you're going through it 30 seconds at a time. Come on, Dad, I want to see Arnold. Incredible. Again, I digress. Joe Bob Briggs' unique style of reviewing movies is and was refreshing and his rise to prominence led to him becoming an increasingly popular cult figure. 
so much so that he almost had a cameo in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. While the movie is poles apart from the unrelenting nightmare of the original, at least Briggs's cameo could have salvaged something from the wreckage. He shot a scene in which Briggs is discussing gore effects with a group of people before he is confronted by Leatherface himself. Instead of running for his life like any normal person would do, he instead just stares in awe of Leatherface's chainsaw skills. The scene unfortunately did not make the movie's final cut. However, it can be found in the special features on some copies of the movie. He did, however, get to stretch his acting muscles with an appearance in the 2014 B-movie Hogzilla about, yes, you've guessed it, a vicious pig on the loose, and the news crew that travels to Florida to investigate the curious phenomenon of the feral hog. Briggs plays an enigmatic but stereotypical movie hick that the crew encounters on their quest. Well, ain't no hogs here. While Joe Bob's reviews and bit parts in movies are fascinating to revisit, it's worth taking a closer look at the shows that help to make him the horror icon that he still is today and that also put him on course for a rendezvous with the Mistress of Macabre herself. His drive-in theater show ran from 1986 to 1996, before the internet, before cell phones, before Wikipedia, and heck, even before Google, which, fun fact, was founded in 1998. Even if you didn't like what was having its premiere on the drive-in, you knew you'd at least learn something new from Uncle Joe Bob. And it would always be entertaining and informative. He would also have an endless supply of fun movie facts, and would often go off on one of his signature rants, if you were very lucky. While shows such as the superb USA Up All Night with Rhonda Shear would have delivered the goods in schlock horror and classic trash cinema, Joe Bob would provide much the same but would also offer up a delightful education with his movie watching. Joe Bob initially started on the show as a guest host who offered comedic relief and in-depth knowledge about the movies he was introducing. And by June 1987, he was made the permanent host of the show. This meant that Joe Bob was able to be as silly and as risque as possible, all in the name of horror goodness, who would educate viewers on the most obscure and wonderful films, including horror, science fiction, exploitation, erotica, and various other sub-subgenres. The movies he featured were not only cult classics, and in some cases, out of print. The offerings included titles such as Sinjnor, Savage Streets, Basket Case, The Bikini Car Wash Company movies, Small Kill, the nigh-endless Emmanuel movie series, Night Eyes 3, and the painfully underrated Jim Wynorski horror action comedy, Hard to Die. These features were often grouped together as themes with the likes of Nick Cassavetti's Night, Emmanuel Week, Post-Apocalypse Month, and Attack of the Killer Queen Bees Month, elevating the novelty factor of the show. As well as featuring a plethora of cult horror movies, Joe Bob also had various celebrity special guests join him on the show. The Exorcist legend Linda Blair was a standout, and he also featured cult stars such as Robert Foster, Gary Busey, Julie Strain, and the various male girls that cropped up in crop tops. In fact, one of the more memorable episodes of Joe Bob's Drive-In was the one in which he screened both the awesome original Night of the Living Dead and the equally kick-ass Tom Savini remake. Some of the surviving members of the Ramiro original joined Joe Bob on the show, as well as the legendary Tom Savini himself. What made the episode so special were not just the guest appearances, but Joe Bob's own infectious, awestruck reactions to them. For many, Joe Bob's drive-in theater was their introduction to Joe Bob Briggs, a persona who was and remains an excellent source of horror movie knowledge, general wisdom, and sheer unparalleled enthusiasm for the drive-in. What is still around are drive-ins. And drive-ins were the other, besides Times Square, drive-in theaters. I used to go with my father in New Jersey. And um, we used to see triple features, you know, Count Yorga, Return of Count Yorga, The Wild Bunch and the Green Berets, you know. And, you know, you had this wonderful thing where people sitting outside, particularly in a summer, a beautiful summer, you know, sitting outside, drinking beer, watching the movies.
Well, our trip down the creepy corridors of legendary horror hosts is almost over. So what better way to conclude this episode other than to discuss the meeting of our horror titans in the Shudder original special, The Last Drive-In, Joe Bob's Haunted Halloween Hangout from October 2022. The two movies on the bill for the show were Elvira's Haunted Hills from 2001 and 1991's Popcorn, whose star Jill Sholin also joined Joe Bob and Peterson in the episode. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Elvira's Haunted Hills is an enjoyable farce of a film. The pastiche of the Roger Corman 1960s Poe adaptations create an inherently limited audience, but this movie will land for them. The film skirts the line between gorgeous and budget where it needs to, but lacks the cutting satirical edge of Elvira Mistress of the Dark. It's suitably risque, and Elvira often smashes down that fourth wall with superbly bad jokes. Elvira is soon to be one of gay Paris' foremost entertainers. <laughs> but the straight guys like me too! <laughs> ...that are older than the castle in which the movie takes place. Both Cassandra Peterson and Jill Scholler are wonderfully entertaining and charming guests on the show. And for this particular writer, the fact that Peterson is still busting out Elvira is a joy to see, especially when she gets to hang out with one of the other great horror hosts himself, Joe Bob Briggs. The greatest part of being a gorehound is not the movies, but taking a journey with the icons we love for them throughout their careers. Both Peterson and Joe Bob have curated a lasting legacy in the horror verse. And now, thanks to modern technology, impressionable young kids such as the one I was back in the 80s won't have to steal his brother's old VHS tapes in order to watch the best horror movie content. Uh, because here is this amazingly looking, goth, beautiful, voluptuous woman on a box. And boing, like my, my eyes were just like, I want that movie. And I didn't know who Elvira was, what Elvira was. Um, and I'll be honest, Elvira was my gateway into horror. Um, because it was one of the very kind of first, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it now, the Elvira, it was Mistress of the Dark, I think, was like 87 or 88. Um, I remember specifically um, really liking the production design. Um, you know, there was like an old castle with like really over the top cobwebs and things like that. Um, and I realized then that my taste and, you know, just that, that aesthetic, I, I really dug. And Elvira led me into other movies that kind of shared the same aesthetic. I mean, it led me into Hammer Horror and other things. And so I credit her for this obsession that I have now of, of horror. <laughs> Halloween too. More of the night he came home. John Carpenter's, and very much also Deborah Hill's, Halloween easily traumatized a generation and then some in 1978. Most of America had not seen anything like this since the antics of Norman Bates in 1960's Psycho. Halloween exposed a new audience to slashers, giving them a new set of fears. However, something just hadn't quite clicked yet. Carpenter thought Halloween was a fluke. He, as well as the original team involved, thought that there was no way to build on what had been created. Why tarnish something that is so devilishly original with subsequent films that may not live up to it? What's hilarious about Carpenter's modesty is that as soon as Halloween was released, it blew up. The thought process then became, Halloween is making a lot of money, let's rip it off. So that's what every director, writer, and producer did as quickly as they possibly could. In fact, that's exactly how Friday the 13th happened. Instead of going the route of subtlety, director Sean S. Cunningham wanted more shock and awe, which after its release led to every slasher amping up the gore factor and changing the horror landscape forever. What I seem to remember the most is that that was the er seemed to be the era of horror film that brought us all of our standard tropes of one killer, not always explained why, going after a bunch of teenagers in the woods one at a time. Um, and that is fr from that has spawned fandom and mockery and all of its gorgeous. Right? Hill and Carpenter thought they were completely done with Halloween after it came out. In fact, Hill actually gave Dick Warlock the Myers mask and said, we're never going to do another movie with him. 
Carpenter had to be coaxed to even entertain the thought with the promise that he could make his next film, The Fog. I think I'll go to Vancouver now. Well, the coaxing didn't work, but getting sued when you go with a rival film company for your next film does. Carpenter settled the suit by making a commitment to do the thing that he had resisted up until that point. Halloween 2. Damn you. Sir. What have you done? I haven't done anything. You let him out! He accepted his fate, sat down with a six-pack of beer, and reluctantly began to dig in. On All Hallows' Eve in 1981, Michael Myers returned to finish the job he started. Halloween 2 picks up right where Halloween leaves off. The movie starts about five minutes after the events of the first one. We see Lori being brought out of the house on a gurney, and the authorities are there to pick up Michael. Except that Michael has disappeared. While producer Erwin Yablons devised the babysitter versus boogeyman idea, the look and origin of Michael Myers is born from an experience that Carpenter had when he was in college. Michael comes from a very real place. In Cut Above the Rest, Carpenter gives an account of when he went with his class to a mental institution. As they're touring the halls, he is suddenly struck by a young patient. His thoughts not only wind up creating one of the most iconic characters of all time, but also the iconic speech given by Loomis. Even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of good or evil, right or wrong. To bring this vision to life, the idea was to get a mask that was a blank face, featureless and pale, basically the face mask from Eyes Without a Face. When Tommy Lee Wallace, the production designer, went on the errand to retrieve a mask, he grabbed a clown mask and a Captain Kirk mask. Wallace said that in mask form, the Shatner mask was featureless. He made a few modifications like cutting the eye holes larger and removing the eyebrows. These simple decisions turned out to be legendary. After the movie premiered, kids and adults alike could not wait to get their own mask. One of my core memories from around 1989 was sitting in our living room at the tender age of five and suddenly hearing the Halloween theme. When I turned around to our small CRT TV, Halloween was playing. I ended up sitting there staring at the television, unable to take my eyes off of what I was seeing. A few days later, we went to a haunted house that was put together by the local high school. And within a minute of walking in, I was confronted by someone wearing a Michael Myers mask. All I remember after that is running out screaming and crying. Hello, help me! Here, please help me! Please! Needless to say, I did not go back to any haunted houses for some time, thanks to the impression that Halloween had made on me. Michael felt real at that point, and could be anywhere that I was. Uh, what those movies bought us is... Uh, if you smoke and drink, you're going to die. If you have sex before marriage, you're going to die. If you bully other kids, you're going to die. Uh, but, <laughs> but if you're wholesome and righteous, you might make it to the end. And then the killer might, may or may not be really defeated because you always want to make a sequel. So there's always like, dun, 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 he's still alive. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, yeah, potential for sequels also happened in the 80s. Uh, endings weren't always the end. Uh, I, I found that to be quite uh, uh, disturbing because I, I like things wrapped up at the end, but it's like, no, oh, there's, a, there's more? Oh, he's not dead yet. He really should be dead. While the birth of Michael may have been based on a brief encounter with a tiny psycho, there are certainly roots that go back to the serial killer boom of the 1970s. It's been said that people who watch horror are just mentally preparing themselves to be scared in a safe environment. There was an odd comfort in watching a big screen boogeyman over one in their own backyard. One of my core memories, and I'm sure it is for a lot of kids of the 1980s, was the PSA, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? While this was originally a gentle reminder for parents of the 60s to check on their kids, it also rings true for the decade of decadence. Pre-internet and pre-cell phones, there was really no way to locate where anyone was. As a kid, you could take off on your bike, 
and your mom would just yell at you to be home before dark. While the idea of a boogeyman lurking in your own hometown was not trauma-inducing enough, Halloween 2 went into another sacred place, the hospital. We watched Lori leave her bed, creeping slowly down the halls, while unbeknownst to her that Michael has already made it to her. The audience leaves the theater with a new fear of a familiar place. All right, listen, um, why don't you check the east wing again, all right? What the first Halloween does for the suspense and tension of the franchise, Halloween 2 elevates that with brutal kills and cements Michael as an indestructible force to be reckoned with. We do get our slow burn moments sprinkled throughout the movie, but those are also balanced with some of the gnarliest kills that we were not expecting. The horror audience gets it when you're telling them a good story. Uh, if you just think it's a slasher picture, I don't think you move people because you don't care about the characters, you don't care about the situation, you don't care. You don't have to preach. You can just, just write good stories. Not only does Michael cement his status because of the carnage and upping his kill count, but he also uses a variety of weapons and makes his kills even more elaborate. There's also a shift when it comes to the Michael we first met, who now not only enjoys stalking his prey, but also thoroughly enjoys his kills. What's the count? 10, so far. As a younger kid in the 80s, several slasher icons had already been firmly established well before anyone knew it which meant I had already seen some things. When Halloween 2 came out, I was not expecting to see Michael not only stab a victim once, but over and over again. Then the hits just kept coming, no pun intended. One of my favorite moments is the bus explosion. At the time, I had no idea that it wasn't Michael who was trapped between that van and the car burning alive. I remember immediately thinking of the haunted house moment and shuddering, but it's also so kick-ass that you just run through the gamut of emotions. When I say that Halloween 2 has gnarly kills, I'm not being modest. At least one of you has been affected by the following scenes. The hot tub rendezvous, the syringe to the temple, the scalpel stabbing. I have a baseball card of this, if that's not weird. Or even the IV blood drain. I've seen a ton of horror flicks, and these moments have stayed with me. I can never pick which one of these is the best, as it always changes. The hot tub definitely seemed to have the most hype around it, as they were talking it up big time on the set. It's the one that I tend to hear about the most, whether it's in documentaries or even amongst the fans. The last 20 or so minutes of the movie really try to take Michael down, which seems nearly impossible, because it is. I mean, Dr. Loomis shot Michael six times before he actually fell to the floor. Six times! Loomis already knew he wasn't dead. Get away from him! He stopped breathing! No! At the time, Lori is able to set Michael on fire and just watching him bust through the door on fire is definitely high art. And we see him fall to the floor, again with our ending moment being a close-up of his mask burning. Most of us want to believe that he's gone, but we know in the back of our heads that it's going to take a hell of a lot more than that. It may take a time machine to just make sure he's erased from existence, because at this point, we have no idea how to get rid of him successfully. Because evil never dies. He is an apex predator. When he surfaces, there will be no pause. There will be no empathy.
Dr. Loomis, I think there's something else you should know. Here comes the real bomb, though. The one little piece of backstory that changes Halloween forever. In the car on the way over to the hospital, Marion tells Dr. Loomis that after unsealing Michael's file, it was revealed that Lori is Michael's little sister, born two years before Michael was committed and was adopted by the Strodes two years after her parents died. Myers has already killed one sister and is now after the other. His motivation for going after Lori is revealed and Michael is no longer just a mindless killer. This polarized fans. It's his sister? That girl, that Strode girl, that's Michael Myers' sister. As a fan, you either feel like this is the stupidest decision ever made or the best twist that you didn't see coming. What's interesting though is the shift in motivation. At first, Michael has no rhyme or reason to do what he does. You can certainly argue, as I know many fans do, that this alone is why he is so terrifying. However, the sister angle got people talking, good or bad. And that's good business in showbiz. Well, you know, the funny thing is that, you know, when you make any movie, you make the best film you can, as, as well as you can, as true to the material as you can, but you never know whether it's gonna stand the test of time. It's impossible to know. Um, so it's nice that some of these movies have, that t even today, have they've kind of stood the test of time and our instincts are right. Honestly, we could buzz back and forth about how much the story shifts, and we would absolutely lose our minds and throw the whole damn book out. Halloween seems to be up for interpretation for whoever is making it, which somehow also throws off what's considered canon and what's not. The point here goes back to what I originally said. The controversial decision only gave Michael a boost which would be a massive reason why removing him from the third film put people into a spiral. They have started off strong with an immediately iconic villain, then moved to super slasher territory blowing the roof off the house, all to pull it back with a full stop. Well, I think it did what, what John always meant to do with the Halloween movies, which was have a seasonal film that didn't always tell the same story. And Tommy Lee Wallace did a great job with that. And uh, I'm glad that it's getting its due now. Uh, a lot of films are like that. People expect something, they get pissed off. It's like, a, a, you know, I call it the fascism of the fandom. But, uh, you know, he took a big hit just because Michael Myers wasn't in it. And the film holds up on its own as a great, scary Halloween film. By the time this third movie hits, all fans are desperate for another go with Myers. It's one of the many complaints of Halloween 3's biggest foe, Joe Bob Briggs. Where's the slasher? Where is Michael Myers? At the end of the day, the absence of Michael Myers only brought an anticipation and longing for the character. It allowed his character to maintain a sense of enigma and made his appearances all the more impactful. Carpenter called this film an abomination. He was brought in later to retool the ending that Rosenthal had crafted, as it was not scary enough. Personally, I think Rosenthal and a reluctant Carpenter both brought elements to the film that make it as great of a sequel as it is. Or at least that's the opinion I'm sticking with. Regardless how you feel about it, Choose your own adventure, canon or not, Halloween 2 catapulted Michael Myers to the slasher icon that he is today. When it comes to the horror genre, no director can match the weaving of comedic elements, not to mention the precise timing of the great Sam Raimi. Now, masters like Wes Craven had a bit of black humor and flicks like Shocker and the Scream franchise was built on the meta take of the genre's shortcomings. John Carpenter's biting and often humorous social commentary built They Live from the ground up, and at the same time, his Showtime anthology Body Bags was far more wits than scares. But Sam Raimi, a man cut from the cloth of the great Three Stooges has always had a slapstick nature to his horror. This isn't to say that his horror is always comedic, but its influence has shaped his very being. In the same year that we got The Misfits' A Ghoul's Night Out, 
an inspiring young filmmaker from the great state of Michigan, Bill Blue, was about to embark on a journey of a lifetime, one that would include ghouls of its own and cement a career in Hollywood while influencing the world of horror for decades to come. My friends, it's time to pack your bags and don't forget the essentials. Let's head deep into the Tennessee woods because when it comes to demonic forces, there is no better place than a remote cabin with you and your friends. What's that you say? You found a book in the cellar and think we should read from it? Ah, what could go wrong? Holy crap. The Evil Dead blew my mind as a young man. It was a genre-bending thing for me. Um, you know, I, I think that in the 80s, it set up the tropes for what would follow in, in horror movies. You have the hillbillies in the woods. You have the kids going camping. You have the crazy creatures from a different world. Um, and I think that with uh, Evil Dead, it was it, it immediately had the tropes of something I thought I knew, and then it went places that I had no fucking idea. And it was a it was such a, a very cool, gross out. Um, they're not going to do that. Oh shit, they're doing that. Oh my god, I can't believe they did that. Premiering in 1981 at the Redford Theater in Detroit, Sam Raimi knew the quintessential hook of marketing: go big or go home. So he wisely stationed ambulances outside the theater as to warn them that this could be dangerous for the audience. One that was packed with the film's investors and rowdy teens looking for a fun and horrifying experience. Because even at a young age, the man knew a universal truth. I mean, the things we're doing, we're doing right. But before we get into the pop culture explosion of what has become classic film literature, I will take you back to the early 90s in the southern suburbs of Chicago. I want to revisit a small independent movie theater off of Halstead Street, where at the age of seven, I got my first taste of Sam Raimi's Dead Eye World. What makes Raimi's Evil Dead so unique is the loose continuity and progression of tone. And of course, Ash, played flawlessly by Bruce the Chin Campbell. You can always tell a person's generation, depending on which film was your introduction to the world of the Necronomicon. And for me, it was seeing Army of Darkness on the big screen. Imagine being a kid sitting in the dark theater with my traditional large pop and box of Sour Patch Kids, experiencing the wackiness of Raimi, the idiocy of a loudmouth braggart, just me, baby. Just me. And ultimately falling in love with this universe. The only thing was, I thought Army of Darkness was the beginning and end of everything Ash, Deadites, and the Book of the Dead. Flash forward a few years later and I'm at my local family video, nestled on the corner of Dixie and 183rd. And in it, besides the musk smell of old carpet and the infamous ugly dark green painted walls, was my second home. And one fateful summer afternoon, I stumbled on an unknown movie called The Evil Dead. My world had changed. Of course, I also learned about part two and that a trilogy was somehow hidden from my existence. What the f is this world? Remember folks, this was before a quick internet search would give you every insight your curious heart desired. So it was Windows 3.0 and super clunky at best. But there it was. I quickly rented it, as it was the 90s and a little kid renting an R-rated VHS was not only normal, but generally accepted. God, I miss the 90s. In the Anchor Bay Entertainment documentary, One by One, We Will Take You, Joe Bob Briggs talks about how the simplicity of The Evil Dead underestimates its effectiveness, saying, The interesting thing about The Evil Dead is that if you told someone what it was about, who had never seen the film, it would sound like a bunch of the biggest cliches in the world. There wasn't anything in the film we hadn't seen before. The kids go in the woods, and the kids don't come out. The Evil Dead, at its core, is a simple story that is elevated by its unwavering intensity, the passion of youth, and Midwestern ingenuity. A story about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I think, like a lot of people who grew up during the 80s, The Evil Dead had an impact, not just because it was a fantastic horror movie, but it showed that you too could make a horror movie. 
the story behind the Evil Dead and what Sam Raimi and his buddies did to bring that thing together and get it off the ground was inspiring for anybody who wanted to be not just a horror filmmaker, but a filmmaker in general. So uh, I think the Evil Dead, obviously, as evidenced by the various sequels that have come over the years, is a durable franchise. The film opens with five friends who head out to a remote cabin in the Tennessee woods for a bit of rest and relaxation. And right away, there is a sense of the unnatural with the porch swing defying physics. But once they listen to a recording translating the Sumerian Book of the Dead, their situation goes from strange to deadly. One by one, each friend succumbs to the evils awoken by the book, saving Ashley Ash Williams as the remaining soul and titular hero. A hero who must dismember them all if he stands any chance of survival. This bloody tale of evil all started in the most casual of places, Michigan State University. <laughs> Sam and his brother Ivan found a loophole at Michigan State, one that would let students rent the school's auditorium at a heavy discount. They would charge people to watch their old goofy Super 8 movies and make some decent money from ticket sales. This got Raimi and friend-slash-economics major Robert Tappert interested in the idea. What if their films could be more than fun, but a financially worthwhile endeavor? This inventive thinking really took off after a showing of their latest Super 8 movie, It's Murder. What made it different from the rest? This is the one where Sam added a jump scare. After seeing the audience's positive reaction, he began writing something full-on horror, hoping to replicate what he saw that night. They say timing is everything, and for Sam and his friends, the 70s was the golden era for horror. Drive-ins accounted for a good chunk of movies released, and with the boom of Grindhouse, there was a big audience for sleaze and gore. To make matters even more lucrative, you had a period where the ratings board was not watching. Giving way to the peak of exploitation at the time. Sam, Bruce, and Rob came up with the idea of making a proof of concept, take the main ideas from Sam's script, The Book of the Dead, and show that they could execute the story in an engaging way. With this, they would have something to show potential investors and help fund the full film. Thus, Within the Woods was born. Of course, getting anything financed with outside money is tough, and this was no exception. Still, everybody here hustled, calling friends, family, and even local businesses to get a buck wherever they could. And since the Evil Dead series is still thriving, it should be no surprise that they got funding. In November 1979, the cast and crew headed to the Tennessee woods with $85,000 of investor money to start filming the Evil Dead. The Evil Dead sat in the odd space of amateur experimentation and executed brilliance. Acting-wise, we get a bunch of young kids who do well enough for the material written, but somehow each get a memorable moment. When you think back to the 80s and your first viewing of The Evil Dead, you can't help but revisit these moments of brutality. I still remember my whole body shuddering when Cheryl stabs Linda in the ankle. What a visceral image, the twisting of the pencil for far too long, or honestly, just long enough to create a lifelong memory. <laughs> Scott's double eye gouge, Linda's decapitation by shovel, and Cheryl's tree rape. Something that still stands the test of time in the category of fucked up scenarios. What the fuck? Ellen Sandweiss has said that the tree's final jab was something she was unaware of, saying in the documentary One by One, We Will Take You. But that final f with the stick was all post-production. I had no idea until I saw it. And of course at the premiere, you know, with my mother there, and that was fun. Bruce Campbell as Ashley Williams isn't close to the heroic moron of the following films, yet we can see the groundwork laid. Richard DeManicor's character Scott plays more of the party guy and always seems like the hero to be until he's out for the count. But the biggest surprise is that the Evil Dead has a male lead, a final guy. 
The formula says you should have a strong female as the lead, but Ash, uh, in the form of Bruce Campbell, was the perfect uh, person for this story. As you'd be right to expect the sole survivor to be Cheryl Williams, or even Shelley. Though the whole thing is basically led by kids, Richard Domanicor, Ellen Sandweiss, Betsy Baker, and Teresa Tilly do an admirable job here. Everyone is able to fully immerse themselves in the world of the film. While the low budget nature forced them to rely on their creativity and resourcefulness in order to make their performances work. Nobody is winning any awards here, but each actor keeps the vibe and tension going. Considering everything working against them, with inexperience, the elements, and long hours, this indie crew kicked ass and took names. The original six-week schedule was a pipe dream that dragged on much longer. December had most of the crew leave for the holidays, plus the annoyance with filming conditions as it was a record cold that hit Tennessee. Though Betsy says that it was because everyone had fulfilled their contractual commitments and nothing more. Who knows the whole truth? But one thing was for sure, the film was not finished. Now what was Sam going to do? Well, look towards the wise men known as the Three Stooges and employ fake Shemps. A tactic used by the small five-person leftover crew would replace all departed actors for insert and non-facial shots. When observing the madness, especially as a kid, one of the reasons The Evil Dead is the masterpiece that it is comes down to the balls-to-the-wall third act. As each friend turns, forcing Ash's hand, the walls seem to be closing in. And I vividly remember the anxiety of things going from bad to worse to all-out hell. The tension and terror build relentlessly throughout, creating a unique and Raimi-specific tone. Though we take the embellished blood for granted now, this is the kind of stuff that marks a kid. And when the pipe bursts, gallons of blood pour out and the cabin finally comes to life, we get movie magic, folks. One of the key reasons why The Evil Dead is a masterpiece is its innovative approach and how Sam Raimi used the camera as an entity itself. The film's use of handheld movements, odd Dutch angles, and some old school tricks mixed with its fast-paced editing was groundbreaking for its time. It was such a change in the horror norm that, according to Edgar Wright, top guys like Francis Ford Coppola were taking ideas from the Evil Dead and using them in big budget flicks like Bram Stoker's Dracula. I'm always hesitant to use the word classic, but what Sam and his friends created back in the winter of 1979 changed the world of horror as we know it. Things weren't easy, conditions were rough, and shooting took longer than expected. The original six-week shoot turned into 12, with reshoots and pickups occurring throughout the year, but they never wavered and they never quit. They changed what didn't work and traversed on giving us one of the most remarkable experiences in horror history. Do you want excessive blood? Check. Do you want inventive uses of the camera? Check. Stop motion gore? You're damn right. We get it in all of its vintage glory, making for one of the best endings of the series. Funny thing about Evil Dead was I couldn't wait to see it. I couldn't wait to see it. You know, I think the Big thing, and Sam Raimi always jokes about the fact that they ran into um, Stephen King on the streets in New York and like asked him to come in and watch the movie and give them the quote. And the quote on the movie poster is the most ferociously original horror movie ever made. That was on the movie poster. How many of us have dreamed of making a movie, but figured it was near impossible? Maybe a thing folks do out west with an amount of money we've never or will ever see. Yet a group of friends from the suburbs of Detroit pulled together their resources, and without a shred of doubt, put every ounce of blood and sweat into a weird little movie that would likely never be seen. Only it was and it became the start of many careers. The film was produced with a budget of only $375,000 by a group of unknown filmmakers with zero industry experience. Let that sink in for a minute. And here we are talking about it today. Why? 
because it's the dream of every horror fan to get out of their comfort zone, take the plunge into the unknown, and make a movie. Independent filmmaking is the lifeblood of creativity. It forces imaginative adaptations to be accomplished through passion and will. The Evil Dead represents all that and more. For us 80s babies, it's the underdog story of our generation. Horror's answer to Rocky. It's a story of friendship, hardship, and the beauty of storytelling. And as we near the end of 1981, it's important to remember the lessons of the Evil Dead. To quote the great film critic Joe Bob Briggs, keep, keep rolling. rolling. And so, whatever you do, just keep rolling. I have always been a massive werewolf and wolfman fan. My father, Stan Winston, was also a massive werewolf fan, and in fact, Long before he came to Hollywood, as a little boy growing up in Arlington, Virginia, he would turn himself into the Wolfman and scare the neighborhood children at Halloween time. So he loved Wolfman. I remember some of my earliest memories of my dad were him transforming himself into scary monsters uh, in our little house, our first house. And one of them was the Wolfman. And uh, I have very vivid memory of uh, one night trying to fall asleep, six years old, hearing the, the sound of shuffling and br heavy breathing and a little snarling, and it's getting closer and I don't wanna turn over, I don't wanna see what it is, and then I can feel its breath on my neck and I look and there's dad, full werewolf. So werewolves have been a big part of my family and my history, and I have to say, American Werewolf in London is one of the greatest werewolf stories ever told. American Werewolf in London was a great combination for me of, of fantastical possibilities with humor. The idea for an American Werewolf in London came to writer-director John Landis over a decade earlier when he was a production assistant on the Clint Eastwood World War II movie, Kelly's Heroes. He wrote the script in 1969, but didn't have the clout to get it made just yet. His first feature would be the eventual cult classic, Schlock, and that would lead to studios taking a chance on the director, who would reward that trust with a string of hits, including Animal House, Kentucky Fried Movie, and The Blues Brothers. He would eventually be given a budget of $10 million to make his movie that had been rolling around in his head for over 10 years. While the studio pushed for recognizable big-name stars, Landis went with his gut and cast relative unknowns, David Naughton, Griffin Dunn, and Jenny Agutter. I saw American Werewolf in London, downtown Pittsburgh movie theater called The Bank Cinemas, with Tom Savini actually, because Tom and I were friends at that point. I think my fascination with it started with the Fangoria cover, which was like a drawing of one of the transformation heads that Rick Baker had done. While Landis was working on his love letter to the old Universal Monster movies, the first book in an eventual series took bookshelves by storm and would be of course optioned for film rights. Joe Dante wouldn't be known for his scripts, and this would be no different as he would bring in future Academy Award nominated screenwriter John Sayles. Sayles had written the script for Dante's first solo directorial effort with 1978's Piranha. Instead of going with more unknown actors like Landis did, Dante would insert famous character actors like Dick Miller, Slim Pickens, John Carradine, and Kevin McCarthy. They would join Patrick Mackney, Dee Wallace, Dennis Dugan, and Christopher Stone, amongst others. Dante had already used Kevin McCarthy and Dick Miller in Piranha, and one of his trademarks would be to use the same actors over and over, even if they were in minor roles. Joe Dante, Joe Dante is another director who really understands uh, the tension that comes between. Now, this is the thing: people go to see horror movies, they laugh a lot. 
but they're not laughing. Well, sometimes they're laughing at the movie, but that's what you try to avoid. They're laughing because you've got them. The Howling follows just the bare bones of the novel it is very loosely adapted from. About the only thing that Winkless and Sales took from the book was the main character, Karen, though spelled differently in both mediums, going to a retreat with her husband after a violent incident. Even with the title being The Howling, the movie does a great job subverting expectations for first-time viewers. By having the newscaster, Karen, attacked by a serial killer, it's only later that you find out that Eddie Kist is a werewolf. The retreat that Karen and her husband go on is actually full of werewolves. The therapist that Karen is seeing decides to send her to what he calls the colony. But it turns out that Eddie is part of their pack. Pun very much intended. Karen's husband is seduced and turned into a werewolf, and Terry, who Karen asked to join her there to investigate after Karen believes Eddie to be there, is killed by a now werewolf Eddie. It's a great scene, and even though you are already aware of the werewolves by then, it gives us the great transformation scene and kills a character that would have ended up being a final girl of sorts. You're like, oh shit. This is really going to take this lady out. Really, all of the movie and how it looks just screams Joe Dante. He may not write his own movies, but he imbues his own characteristics into every one of them. Having the same actors show up in small roles is also the equivalent of cinematic comfort food. After Terry's killed by Werewolf Eddie, her boyfriend Chris comes to investigate and not only kills Eddie but exposes the entire colony for what they are, people who turn into werewolves at will rather than only by the light of a full moon. This is not only different from most werewolf lore, but also its twin release that year. In another part of the world, American backpackers David and Jack are in Yorkshire when they come across the slaughtered lamb a pub with some locals who are not friendly at first, but eventually warn them to stick to the roads. They wander off the roads into the moors and are attacked by a wolf, with Jack dying and David being bitten. While the locals kill the creature, David sees a man lying naked. He wakes up weeks later in a London hospital and is told he and his friend were attacked by a lunatic. Jack appears to David in spirit, and warns him that he must kill himself before the next full moon, or he will kill innocent people. David has awful, vivid dreams, but doesn't fully believe he will turn into anything, while also starting a relationship with his nurse Alex. A more deteriorated Jack tells David once again to end his life, but he refuses, and the next night he does indeed change into a werewolf, this scene is on the Mount Rushmore of practical effects, and it's a testament to how good the movie is that it's not the only scene that people remember. I had already done The Howling with Rob Bottin, and there's a whole story about how Rick and Rob fought and fought and fought over who came up with the technique. I don't want to get into that right now. Um, Rick did. <laughs> David kills innocent people, but has no memory of it until he sees it on the news and realizes that it must have been him. Jack appears one final time, now accompanied by the corpses of the six people that David killed the previous night, and pleads with David one final time to end the curse. David changes again and kills a few more people before being shot by the police after Alex pleads with the wolf. While it appears he understands her, his base urges take over and he lunges at her before being shot. And it's a tragic ending too. There's no happy ending to that movie. There's no happy ending to that movie, which I think also really does epitomize the late 70s and 80s horror movies. While they do use the full moon, 
Silver bullets are not needed to end the life of a werewolf here. The two movies were both successful, though London would do better bringing in $62 million on its $6 million budget, and The Howling returning $18 million on its $1.5 million budget. Both movies were like nothing we'd ever seen before, and they each take different approaches to their eventual final products. An American Werewolf in London is more darkly humorous, where The Howling takes an almost tongue-in-cheek approach. The Howling has some surprise character deaths, while London kills off one of its main characters early on, even though death isn't about to keep him out of the movie. London has a smaller, more intimate cast, while The Howling has an almost crowded feel. Then there's the special effects, and boy oh boy are they special. You always wanted to see a werewolf transformation? Here's your werewolf transformation. When I saw these movies as a kid, I was absolutely floored with what they were able to accomplish in terms of their creatures. Watching David turn into a wolf for the first time is like watching a magician do tricks in front of your eyes. You know it's not real, but you'd be hard pressed to explain exactly what's going on. I remember sitting in the theater and we were all gobsmacked at watching what was happening on film with the, you know, the, the extension of his face and the, and the hairs growing out. The hair thing, I did that one, that was good. I'll tell you how that was done, it's pretty obvious now though, but made a fake arm, smooth on once again, uh, put this fine wire mesh behind it and then punched in all the invis in individual hairs, punched them all in and then flipped the arm over, opened it up, put acrylic plastic on the back that would grab all of the, where those hairs were punched in. So it just looks like a normal arm from the front with hair like that. But in the back, all those hairs, the other end of them were connected to acrylic plastic. Put handles on that, rolled film, pulled the hair through the fake arm, and then when the film was reversed, it looked like it was going out. The Howling gets the job done almost as well, with its creatures being more of a callback to Lon Chaney's more human-wolf hybrid. Except, well, it looks a lot better here. Both of these movies are shining examples of why practical effects will always beat CGI. And there's no fun in that. There's no, there's no artistic endeavor in entering things on a computer and it just appears. It's too easy. It's too easy. It doesn't, it doesn't require um, blood, sweat, and tears, which is what made that transformation so great. This category is also where the two films share something. Rick Baker was already fairly established, working with directors like Larry Cohen and a little-known director named George Lucas with his little space opera. But he was also familiar with Landis. In fact, he was a makeup artist on Schlock back in 1973 for Landis, and he was told about the werewolf movie that John was trying to get going. He agreed to help out with that movie, but it took so long to get off the ground that he eventually assumed it wasn't happening. He joined Dante's project, but would eventually leave to fulfill his promise to Landis. It worked out okay for him. We're all sitting there with our mouths hanging open, we're all kids, right? And it's Rick Baker. And I raised my hand like a student. I said, well, Rick, that's, it sounds great. It sounds way better than The Howling, but who, who, who's going to make all this stuff? And Rick's like, you kids are going to do all this. And I'm like, we don't know how to do that stuff. Come on. Um, so he goes, that's okay, I'm going to teach you. And so we did. We just uh, learned it step by step. And the thing that was really fascinating about that is because um, because Rick had confidence in this young ragtag group of kids, it gave us all confidence. If Rick Baker was going to stamp his name on the work that we helped him create, that told us that we were maybe better than we thought we ever could imagine. And so it really gave us a lot of confidence and it made the project go much, much, much more smoothly. Losing Rick Baker is always going to be a devastating proposition. But how do you fill that void? How about by plugging in wonderkin Rob Botten? Botten had worked with Baker on Star Wars, 
and had also worked with Dante prior to this on Piranha, so the transition was an easy one. I must say though, uh, American Werewolf was nominated for Best Makeup the very first year that they had that category in the Academy Awards. And who was he up against? Stan Winston, my father, for his work in Heartbeats, transforming mm -hmm. Andy Kaufman and Bernadette Peters into these two robots that fall in love. And I said to Dad, you know, Heartbeats is great, Dad, but American Werewolf's gonna win. And I just had to be honest with him. And he knew, he knew. While Baker would win the Oscar, Botten would set himself up to make some of the greatest effects of all time just a year later on John Carpenter's The Thing. His work with the air bladders and real-time transformation in the scene where we see Eddie transform is one of the quintessential moments, not only of the movie, but of the 1980s as a whole. The discussion on which film is better is one of the more difficult and subjective conversations of the 1980s. It would come down to which one you saw first, your preference of Joe Dante versus John Landis, or your feelings on the rules of werewolves. The Howling for me, that transformation is the better werewolf transformation. I really think it is. Because there's something about, there's one shot in The Howling where you go back wide and you realize just how tall the werewolf is in contrast to the woman. And that instantly made it feel so palpably real. It wasn't bits and pieces, it was a wide shot. And they did all the little interstitials and then boom. For me, An American Werewolf in London was what I saw first, and it resonated with me more with the emotional stakes of the characters. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't fall in love just a little bit with Alex. I looked for more David Naughton and Griffin Dunn movies, and for me, it's the greatest werewolf movie of all time. The Howling was something I discovered later in life. I already knew who Joe Dante was and enjoyed his work and was going through his catalog. I've grown to love the collection of character actors as well as appreciating it for what it is rather than just being disappointed that it isn't London. The legacy of both films is very different. An American Werewolf in London is widely appreciated but did get a dud of a sequel of sorts with An American Werewolf in Paris. As good as the special effects are in London, they are that bad with CGI in Paris. The Howling became a ludicrously long series, even eclipsing the book series of three, with a total of eight films. Some of those have moments to enjoy, but none of them came close to the magic and spectacle of the first. While the movies will live on for generations to enjoy, we'll never have another year like 1981. A year where full moons, silver bullets, and wolf attacks were all the rage. Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.